Okay, well, um, thanks very much for joining us for this afternoon session, everybody. And um, thanks uh, very much to Livewire for, for having us. Um, Todd, welcome. Um, got to kick it off, as said in the, um, the introduction, uh, Soul Pats has got a tremendous history. It's, it's one of, I think, two companies that are still trading under the original ticker, uh, with BHP being the other one. Um, dating back to uh, the early 1900s. So it listed for 121 years, never missed a dividend, which is um, amazing. And for the last um, you know, 20 years, has grown shareholder returns at 12.5% per annum. So Todd, first question is the obvious one. How do you do it? <laughs> How long have you got? Uh, um, thanks very much for that kind introduction and for having me today. Uh, look, I, I mean, when we think about our success, we try to distill it down to really three uh, major competitive advantages that are structural. Uh, the first one is that we've, we're lucky enough to have permanent capital. So as you said, we uh, listed in 1903, we're still investing that balance sheet today. And the advantages to permanent capital is that uh, we don't have that sort of redemption risk hanging over our heads that a lot of fund managers uh, usually have. And that means that we can make long-term decisions without worrying about uh, you know, short-term uh, derivation from market performance and, 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 and that sort of thing. Uh, it also means that we don't have uh, liquidity risk so that we don't, you know, we don't have to pay out uh, money back to shareholders who, who want it. They can just sell their shares anytime they like. Uh, the only thing that we need to do is pay dividends every year and we do that from the cash flow that we generate out of the portfolio. Um, so that means that we can capture that premium for your liquidity that's available in the market. Uh, the other thing that we have, this, you know, the second advantage is flexibility. We've got complete flexibility to go anywhere and do anything in any asset class. Uh, and that's really powerful because you know, obviously there are different times in the market where different assets are more attractive than others. And the third thing that we have is, is our reputation. I mean, we're fortunate to have been around a long time. We're, we're well regarded. People want us to be their capital partner. Uh, and we try to take advantage of that competitive competitive situation as much as we can because um, uh, yeah, that, that reputation was hard earned and it's worth something to us. Thanks, Todd. Um, probably the one thing that you, you didn't mention there um, was the team. And um, yeah, I've been lucky enough to have dealings with Sol Pat over many years now and you do have a great team. Um, can you just describe how you've built that and how you incentivize your people to deliver results? Uh, thank you. It's very kind of you to say. I mean, we are blessed with a, uh, a really high quality team of people. Uh, and the first thing that we have is longevity. So we've been working together for a long time. Uh, I've been with the business now for 20 years. Um, there's another portfolio manager that looks after our private equity that's been there 20 years. Uh, the head of our credit and structured equity uh, and, and emerging companies team has been there 17 years. So yeah, we've all worked uh, in the business a long time, around each other for a long time. Uh, and I guess we've just been able to sort of pick up on some of those things that have been uh, successful in the business for a long period of time. Um, I, I think the other thing that we do really well is work as a team. And unlike a lot of other places that we see where people are much more focused on their own success and their own uh, you know, portfolio, it's a very important principle for us that capital flows to the best ideas. And so, so even if you're working in a private equity team, you don't have a sort of sense of ownership of that capital. If we've got a better opportunity in listed equities or credit, then the money will just seamlessly flow from one portfolio to the next. And, and the rewards and the incentives come from a group level. So when shareholders win, our people win. Uh, and, it's, and that's much more important than people just being singly focused on the thing that they're doing and not working as, as a team. And the other benefit is that we become better investors along the way because now you're comparing what you're doing in your portfolio to what's available elsewhere in the market. And a lot of people don't have that benefit. They're, they're, they're sitting there thinking only about, say, listed equities, uh, but they're not actually comparing what listed equities is looking like compared to other asset classes. So we've got the benefit of being able to constantly be assessing, is this the best investment that's available to us right now across any asset class? Great. Um, and so just talking about the portfolio uh, a little, can you, can you just describe, I guess, how it stands today, how you positioned uh, any of the key changes that you've been making through the course of this year and and where you're seeing the opportunities uh, as we head into 2025? 
Sure. So if I think about, uh, I mean, this last year that's just gone, uh, we did about $4.7 billion of transaction activity across the portfolio. That's total acquisitions and disposals. Uh, and on a net basis, we deployed about a billion dollars. And, and so if I think about where did that billion dollars go, uh, about $500 million went into credit. So we, you know, we feel very good about the uh, the opportunities in credit right now. I mean, it's giving us downside protection, but uh, a greater than market return. So that just seems like a, a good uh, way to invest, uh, to preserve capital, protect your downside and, and get something better than, you know, we could be experiencing in the equities market. Uh, we've been continuing to put bolt-ons into our private equity portfolio. So we spent about $150-odd million last year uh, just beefing up some of our positions there. Uh, we put $200 million into uranium uh, assets last year. Uh, that's that's a, a thematic that we you know, feel very strongly about. Um, and actually just the energy thematic generally, we, we feel very uh, positive about the, the long-term demand for energy uh, from you know, all sources, whether that's electrification of, of everything, EVs, uh, the artificial in intelligence and, and data centers and all of that sort of stuff, uh, just uh, urbanization, growing populations, uh, wealthier nations. Uh, I think that the, the world's going to need a lot more energy than, than um, you know, we can currently forecast. And so we're very positive on energy. Um, just going back a few years now, um, you made the acquisition of, of Milton. Um, just thinking, we like with the benefit of of hindsight now. Can you describe what that acquisition sort of did, has done uh, for Sol Pats? And you know, are you seeing similar opportunities out there today to perhaps repeat it, given how good it has been? It's been fantastic. It was really transformative for us. I mean, we were at a point where we were really fully invested with some businesses that were doing phenomenally well. Uh, they had very low tax cost bases, so it meant that it was difficult for us to take money out of a TPG, New Hope or Brickworks and recycle that into some of the other opportunities that we were seeing. And, and so what we what we got with Milton was the ability to, uh, you know, and the liquidity to take advantage of these opportunities. So what we see today is a much more diversified portfolio. Uh, you know, we've, we've got over a billion dollars in credit. We've got one and a half billion dollars in private equity. Uh, and just that ability to, to uh, you know, churn the portfolio more uh, into the better ideas that we keep seeing. And so if I look back at the last three years, you know, there's been a, a phenomenal uptick in the, uh, in the dividend growth. Um, uh, I mean, we've had a, a great 24 year run of, of increasing dividends, but actually the growth has accelerated in the last few years since Milton. And then from a, 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 a capital perspective, um, in the last three years, we've performed, uh, about double what the index has done. So. So if I think about the aggregation of the alpha that we've generated over the three years since Milton was uh, was acquired, we've added about $2 billion on top of market returns in the last three years. That's great. And, and um, I guess with the way the portfolio is positioned, it, it's got quite a strong home bias or a, you know, it's fairly Australian centric. Do you, do you see the opportunity to go uh, offshore? Today we're seeing you know, Regal bidding for platinum um, does that go through your mind? Yeah, we think about that a little bit. I mean, you know, there's no doubt that uh, uh, our strength is in Australia. This is where our networks are. This is where our deals uh, come from. And it would be naive of us to think that we could go and compete on the same basis uh, in you know, Europe or North America. Um, but then when I look at the portfolio, there is actually a pretty good international uh, flavour to it. So just looking at our strategic investments, Brickworks has got a North American uh, business uh, in, in, in bricks. Um, New Hope is a, an export-oriented company. Uh, we've got businesses that are, businesses that are wholly uh, based outside Australia, like uh, 2S, a Singaporean mobile business, uh, and Apex, a healthcare business that's listed in Malaysia. So there's there's always been you know a very strong competitive um, bias to company or a bias towards companies that are competitive on a global scale. So we want to uh, you know, find private equity businesses that can compete globally, um, and we want uh, all of our businesses to grow into to, to businesses that are bigger than they can be if they were uh, only domestic. Mm. And and the um, I guess the increasing focus that you've had on on private equity and on credit as part of the portfolio. Um, can you 
can you sort of describe the size of the opportunity that you see in those markets? And then um, also how that competes against what you can see in the listed markets. Mm. Well, as I said, with credit, we think that it's a better opportunity than listed markets just because, you know, we're still buying or we're still investing in companies that we we like the business and, and we would be happy to buy the equity. But we've come up with a, a structured uh, a structured way of investing which protects our downside and gives away some of our upside. But you know, when that portfolio is generating sort of circa 15% IRRs, uh, that to us seems like a superior way to invest than, than investing in, in the equity and, and, and having that sort of preference in the capital stack, yeah, you know, if anything sort of gets, um, uh, goes wrong in, in markets. So we really like uh, credit and, and we would expand that portfolio and we are expanding it, but we would certainly continue to expand it where we can. The only problem is there's not a, a huge depth of opportunities for us to generate 15% in the kind of opportunities that we like. So things that are, uh, you know, we've got a senior secured position in robust business that, um, you know, we think has a quality business or, or quality assets. So the, the, the opportunity to grow that is somewhat limited. We're at a billion. We, we doubled that in size in the last 12 months. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know that it can get to double again, uh, and, and especially as we start to see churn in that portfolio. So some of the existing positions will uh, repay us. Uh, but in terms of private equity, the last three years, it's been sort of growing at 20% IRRs. Uh, there's a great opportunity there. There's really an unlimited opportunity to continue to buy, uh, you know, really high quality growing businesses that need more capital for growth. Uh, and there's certainly a you know a whole generation of baby boomers now who own very good businesses that need to transition to the next stage. Um, uh, and there's also you know, listed companies that that can get privatised. So there's no real limitation on what we uh, do with our private equity portfolio, but it's sort of going to be more opportunity led. And how are you screening for those opportunities? Because as you say, it's uh, it's an unlimited playing field. Uh, so a lot to get through in that respect. Yeah. So I mean. The way that we tried to uh, narrow the scope of our private equity was we, we started out by thinking about what thematics are we interested in. And, and, and we really pick thematics that are, have long-term tailwinds uh, and also that sort of global competitiveness that I talked about earlier. And so where we uh, settled on was uh, energy transition, which we, we've, we've done with a business called Amp Control. Um, we picked education, uh, and we ended up uh, settling on a, a swim school business, which is which is going very well. Australia is very globally advantaged uh, in agriculture, so we've got quite a decent agricultural portfolio, uh, and also financial services. So we're, you know, we're very strong in financial services and the growing superannuation uh, pool, uh, and and the need for good quality wealth advice. Uh, so we've got a business called called uh, Ironbark. So we sort of actually ended up executing on all of the thematics that we chose. Uh, apart from one, we also picked health and aging, uh, and we've been looking at a lot of uh, assets in that sector for some time, but um, it's four out of five uh, we, we actually executed on. Yeah, great. Um, Todd, I, I wanted to ask you about um, your capital raising initiative at the end of August. Um, so you did a restructuring of your, of your bonds, and also I think, you know, we're discussing beforehand, first time that you've raised equity since listing in 1903, which is quite extraordinary in itself. Um, can you just explain uh, thought processes there and what that does for your business in terms of setting it up for the immediate future? Yes, as I mentioned, I mean, the last 12 months, we've actually been deploying cash into new investment ideas. So this was really about uh, refilling the tin. Um, we, uh, you know, we we had a, a nine hundred odd billion dollar uh, cash position that that was almost fully depleted, uh, and we we had a convertible bond that we issued about four and a half years ago that was coming up for uh, a renewal in uh, in the next year or so. So we we bought out the existing convertible bond uh, that closed that off. That was so for four and a half years we got uh, money on a coupon of 0.625%. Per annum, so that was uh, you know a fantastic experience for us, uh, and it was such a good experience that we decided to go again. So we raised uh, another four hundred and fifty million dollar convertible bond. Uh, this time it was a little bit more expensive because the uh, the rate cycles changed, but 
uh, that's paying uh, that that's a cash coupon of uh, under two point nine percent for the next six years. Uh, and we were also fortunate to be in a position where some institutions in Australia were um, uh, keen on buying stock, uh, and so we raised a little bit of equity to 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 fund the, the repurchase of the existing convertible bond. Um, so we did that at no discount. Uh, I think it's um, you know it was a phenomenal deal, and and as I said, it sort of refills the tin so that we're now cashed up. We've got about six hundred billion dollars of cash today uh, to to look for new new opportunities. Um, and interest rates hitting uh, you know arguably an inflection point uh, this week, or certainly in the US. How much does that play on your mind? Your position around those types of moves, or do, you know, being long term, do you just sort of look through it? Exactly. I mean, we we are long term, so we're not really focused on the short term macro. But um, but but you know, we also are conscious of what the macro is telling us about um, about the the environment that we're investing in, and and so yeah, while everyone's getting excited about interest rates coming down, you know, we look at that and say, well, that's sort of telling you that the the global economy is a little weaker uh, than it than it once was, and what impact is that going to have on corporate earnings, and and how does that impact not just our existing portfolio, but also uh, the things that we're we're looking to invest in? Um, so you know that that sort of thing is the reason why we wanted to get a little bit more money in the tin uh, and and have that flexibility because um, yeah you know, there, there are some signs of some softening happening, and uh, and that often leads to great opportunities. Um, Todd, it's it, it's really quite difficult to find a direct peer for sole parts, um, certainly domestically. Uh, one name that does get put up occasionally, and I'll flatter you there, is Berkshire Hathaway. Um, or to, who do you see as your as your peer group, and how do you benchmark your own performance? Yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously flattering to be mentioned in the same sentence as Berkshire Hathaway, and there's some similarities and and, and some things that are a little different. Um, I, I mean, they are a little bit more of a, co a conglomerate than we are. We we tend to be just an investment house. We are, um, although we are building up a private equity portfolio, but you know, essentially, we are are just looking to uh, you know invest capital in other people's businesses rather than own those businesses and, and, and operate them. Um, but the, yeah, the way that we think about our strategy is what would you do or how do other people invest uh, if they were given uh, yeah, billions of dollars? And, and so we've sort of looked at family offices from around the world, people who have you know, sold their business or inherited some money or whatever, whatever the case may be. And, and they all tend to invest in a very similar way, which is they will be diversified across asset classes. They'll be concentrated in the things that they know and like and have high conviction on. Uh, they will be looking to extract a, a fairly steady dividend or income stream from the assets, uh, and they'll be looking to preserve capital. And so we thought, well, everybody who has that that opportunity to invest a, a lump sum of money tends to adopt a very similar style, and yet there is no listed companies that do that. Uh, yeah, you know, we have LICs in Australia, but they tend to be singularly focused on, you know, certain asset classes. Um, whereas, you know, we, we're trying to provide a uh, the, the the same kind of opportunity to any investor in the Australian market. We've got sixty thousand shareholders, um, but you can invest through us in the same way that any family office would invest, and you get the benefit that we get from scale. The, you know, we we get shown the best ideas. We we can invest in anything and go anywhere. We can employ a great team of people, and um, and so you know it is a surprise to me that we are we are unique. And I don't know, even know that there's many international peers for what we do, um, but there's certainly uh, a lot of family offices that that invest in a very similar way to us. Okay, thanks, Todd. We do have time for some questions. Um, just a reminder: if you'd like to ask one, then please put it through the uh, through the app. Todd, do you consider um, ecology economics uh, when you invest to make sure that there's a sustainable uh, future for the company and future generations? Absolutely. Um, yeah, when I think about you know, the recent sort of focused on ESG, 
you, we, we've been thinking about this this sustainability and sustainable investing for a very long time. And when 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 you're a long term investor, and when you're thinking about making investments in companies, I mean, our biggest investments today have been in the portfolio for you know several decades. And and so we are thinking about not just the sustainability of the industry in which that company operates, but also the sustainability uh, of our business in that operating environment. So uh, our, our people looked after, our communities looked after, is the environment looked after, is our relationship with regulators and the government and, and any other stakeholder, our shareholders, all of those things are worth investing in. And, and so we've been doing that for a long time. Um, you know, I think ESG went off the rails a little bit in, in, a few years ago where it was just simply about divestment. Uh, we didn't think that that was particularly a, a thoughtful approach because these companies were still going to exist. They were just going to get pushed into, you know, private hands and people with, you know, perhaps uh, not the same reputation as us to preserve or, or the, um, uh, you know, that long-term attitude that I just spoke about. So... I think the, the, the narrative is changing and people are coming back to our way of thinking uh, in that uh, these things are important. You, you need to earn your social license to operate uh, and uh, your reputation is important and it's valuable. I think the next one's a really good question. Um, does the need to keep the dividend streak alive make you more risk averse uh, or affect portfolio allocation decisions? I wouldn't say it makes us risk averse uh, but it we do manage the portfolio to ensure that we are generating a reasonable yield that we can then uh, use to pay increasing dividends to our shareholders uh, and we have the flexibility to do that we we've got the ability to invest across different asset classes and and um, uh, so yeah we, we do focus on it. it it's important to us because it's important to our shareholders uh, but I wouldn't say that we're doing it in a way where we're sacrificing total total shareholder returns. I mean, th there's no point me standing up here and, and saying, uh, you know, hasn't it been a, a great 24 years of continued growth in the dividends uh, if we've been destroying capital along the way? But that's why, you know, it's important that you look at both metrics and, and the total shareholder returns um, have exceeded the market by sort of 3% per annum for 20 years. That's a phenomenal outcome particularly when we're talking about uh, in the last 12 months, 77% uh, of, of fund managers uh, didn't beat their benchmark and actually gets worse as you go on. Uh, I think it's 85% over the last 15 years have underperformed the benchmark. So we're outperforming the benchmark on a total return basis, but also making sure that we're generating enough cash yield to pay higher dividends to our shareholders. I think um, we're coming up on time, but uh, we do have time for one more, and I think it's a good way to finish. Um, what What is the one risk in financial markets uh, that you think investors are not talking about at the moment? Oh, I don't know whether I can narrow it down to one. Uh, I mean, I, I do think that we're in an environment where everything is seen as good news. So as I said before, interest rates coming down, people say... Isn't that great? But the reason why interest rates are coming down is because, uh, you know, I think corporate corporate earnings are, are going to be a little uh, slower in the next few years. And, um, and and we have been in the environment where there has been, you know, support for every asset class and the printing of money and massive budget deficits and things like that around the world. Um, I think, you know, it's been good for a long time. And uh, I think, you know, I don't know if it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, but... You know, investing is a cyclical game, and, uh, and and there will be a cycle when things are going to get tough. Great. Uh, I've been told we've got time for one more question. Uh, no, uh, no problem. So AI, um, there was a lot said in that in the in the last presentation. Um, how are you positioned around AI? I guess internally, it's a good way to screen for opportunities, but also from an investment perspective. Yeah, I think um, I mean. The, our portfolio is quite a conservative one. Uh, you know, we are we like old industry businesses that have proven their business model. They've got cash flows that we can value. We're not particularly good at picking the next shiny big thing. Um, and I and I do think that you know it's the second and third time round when you really make money on this sort of stuff. Like you could have been very early on the internet. 
uh, before the internet bubble in 2000. And sure, you could have made some money, but you could have lost a hell of a lot of money as well. But when, when that kind of technology then becomes ubiquitous and valuable to every business, then you start thinking about the businesses that have good quality assets, good quality pr proven business models that can benefit from this new technology. And there will be a, a huge number of companies that will be beneficiaries of AI. And, and so they're the things that we're starting to look for. We're, you know, we're not going to be investing in chip makers and things like that, but we are invested in Goodman because we know that AI is going to drive data centers and it already is showing up in some very, very strong growth in, in the Goodman share price last 12 months. So we try to think about who were the beneficiaries rather than investing in the technology itself. I understand. Great. Well, I think we're out of time there. Todd, thank you very much um, for coming along today and for making your, your time available. Greatly appreciated. And thank you um, very much. Please, everyone, thank Todd. Uh, okay. <laughs>